give me one sec while we get going here and then I'll introduce today's program. Cool. Welcome everyone. I'm Daniel Tut. Pleasure to host you today. This is quite an exciting uh, opportunity we have. Uh, Dr. Duane Roussel with us uh, offering a seminar on psychoanalysis and politics which is uh, in fact precisely what our study group SGPP if you are uh, fond of acronyms <laughs> uh, focuses on um, just as a little quick plug we have a great conversation coming down the pipeline on Frederick Jameson and his reading of psychoanalysis and Marxism with Anna Kornblue. And that's going to be um, on the Zero Books channel probably tomorrow. We have a partnership with Zero Books YouTube channel. Um, this one is actually streaming from our own YouTube channel. Uh, so check out that YouTube channel. I'll put it in the chat for folks to look at our past seminars. These are free uh, public seminars. Um, I will say also, uh, Duane has offered this completely complimentary uh, as an effort to um, think aloud together. Um, and so this is um, not um, for credit. It's quite um, spontaneous, which is kind of how we sort of prefer to take things. Um, there's no readings. Although maybe in our discussions, people can recommend things that they want us to read. Uh, that might be helpful. Um, there's no um, uh, certain requirements that you have to have to participate in today's conversation. And literally, it goes without saying that we want to invite a cordial, comradely climate of discussion. And maybe we even will do breakout rooms at a later point in the conversation. So that's a bit of ground rules and who we are. Uh, I think most of you know Duane. Um, Duane and I just had a great uh, podcast conversation. You can check it out on the page or on our podcast as well, um, talking about some similar themes we're going to explore today. Um, Duane is the author of four or five books. He's invented and furthered a field of study in in anarchism, which is called post-anarchism. I'm not sure how many posts there are. I think, Duane, we're at two posts or three. There's many post-anarchisms, but Duane has um, carved out a very interesting scholarly uh, domain in that regard. And then in the last like decade, he has focused on Lacan and politics and has published multiple very interesting works in the field of Lacan and politics. And... Uh, so he always has something new to say, and he's coming at us today from Ireland, somewhere in the country of Ireland, which I think is now a kind of European tax haven, if I, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, uh, but a quite beautiful one. Nonetheless, welcome, Duane. The floor is yours, my friend. Thanks so much, Daniel. It's nice to see you. Uh... All of you here, Yulia, Vulcan, Hugh, I was thinking uh, I'd much prefer to hear Hugh speak. Uh, and maybe we would have the pleasure of maybe Hugh leading a seminar or a, or a lecture or something. If you would do it at some point in the future, I, I would really love that. Jonas, it's nice to see you, Mark, everybody. Um, I just wanted to begin with uh, by, by thanking, I want to thank Pavel Tomar, Zuleika Malzeda, Simone Medina Polo, uh, the Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour, and another person who prefers to be no one uh, for supporting my work through my psychoanalytic ramblings um, uh, Patreon account. Uh, it's humbling for me because their work, your work, is so much more promising than anything that I'm doing, but I find inspiration in it. Um, so, and I'd also like to thank, of course, Daniel Todd for his friendship all these years and for providing a platform for me to speak today. 
um, and for all of you for standing on that platform with me to the extent that you will. Um, I don't know where to begin. I guess um, the title, The Unconscious uh, is Politics. I guess I'll begin by asking myself a question. What is this device that we so often refer to as the unconscious? There, I think there comes a time when it's difficult to speak about it. Maybe that time is now, especially for me. Uh, we shouldn't begin with the presupposition that we know the unconscious through its various formations. You know, dreams, slips of the tongue, symptoms, jokes, and so on. I mean, I think they still offer some surprises, but they also produce, it also can produce shock. The unconscious shocks. And I'm, I don't know why I'm thinking about this, but I once heard a philosopher, it wasn't so long ago, a philosopher that I know, claim that psychoanalysis privileges humans because of its focus on the formations of the unconscious. You know, the argument is that we privilege human beings because they have an unconscious or something like that. So, the, you know, some have even gone so far as to claim that we discount psychotics, that psychoanalysts discount psychotics because they've canceled their subscription to the unconscious. But it seems abundantly clear to me that humans are not at all in a privileged position, especially when we compare them to say the lilies in the field, rocks, non-human animals. We, like to put it really simply, mother nature is devouring us. So it's not a privileged position because it means that hu the, these beings that we call humans could become extinct. So I think the problem is actually much worse than what my philosopher friend has claimed. Humans are not entirely submitted to the unconscious. So we might even claim that even among human animals, there are a few human beings. And maybe we're now discovering that the human being has already become extinct. Uh, Walter Benjamin claimed something like 100 years ago or something like that, and he wasn't alone in making the claim, we can think of all kinds of other people, that the human is primarily a being in language. It means that the unconscious is an accident. Not all of humans have submitted to it, to the unconscious structured like a language. So I think that's what makes a human being. And maybe it's another way to interpret the feminine side of Lacan's formulae of sexuation, uh, which isn't just exclusively for biological humans. You know it, not all X are submitted to the phallic function, which translates into not all humans are castrated. And finally, not all humans have been inaugurated into the unconscious structured like a language. It's a problem of initiation um, into the unconscious. Instead of inauguration, maybe I should have said initiation. In the 1970s, uh, Lacan said something like, there's no longer any trace of in initiation in the world. What does it mean ultimately? It means, my friends, that we don't share in our experience of the unconscious. Jacques-Alain Miller said, I quote him, the practice of initiation is what produces a sectarian group of those who share the same experience and which moreover always relies upon a, gri a grimoire, 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 um, a book of magic, magical spells, grimoire. Um, might seem like a recipe book, maybe what you'd see in some of the Harry Potter movies or something like that. 
So I think we have to resist this temptation to take the formations of the unconscious as a grimoire, as if it, there's the, a few major ingredients in the cooking up of psychoanalysis. So when it comes to the unconscious, I would say there's still something magical about it, some surprises left. For example, it's surprising for me, what I just said, that not all humans are submitted to the unconscious. It, it, I happen to like surprises. I know Mark reminded me that I've been repeating it. This word surprises. I happen to like surprises. You know what? Why not? I'll share an anecdote with you about surprises. I returned not so long ago to, um, to my third period of personal analysis, a period of um, interminable analysis. And those sessions went on for a few weeks, not so long, um, until I said something like, I don't know why I keep coming back, except for the fact that each time you end the session, I find it surprising. And it's in those moments that it, the unconscious is reinvented for me or something like that. Maybe I'm not using I'm not using the technical word invention, which is a technical word, maybe in the Lacanian orientation. But at that precise moment, when I said that, my analyst stood up, said, OK, and walked to the door, opening it. This particular analyst has a commendable practice of standing, of, of ending the session. Um, by standing up abruptly and walking to the door very quickly. I decided that at each moment when she did that, each moment of surprise involved her standing up for psychoanalysis. Standing up for psychoanalysis precisely in the moment when I wasn't capable of doing it. Uh, and, and I think that's what brings many people to analysis, a failure in their commitment to stand up for psychoanalysis. So in the interim, I find myself now with the responsibility of standing up for psychoanalysis. And that's what I'm trying to do in my own way, which doesn't mean that it's easy, especially when, like today, I'm among friends. Um, and it raises an important question. What about psychoanalysts? Are they submitted to the unconscious? Psychoanalysts are, are, you know, they're not entirely extinct psychoanalysts, though there's very few of them in the world, very few. But are they human beings? Maybe they are in spite of their various mutations. Um, Maybe they are human. They know how to be human, which means that they know how to make use of the unconscious. They can't do without it. This invention from Freud, the unconscious, which is why it returns back to them, I think, even after they've abandoned it, after all of its meanings have been extinguished, the meanings of the unconscious and so on. And I was, I was also thinking not so long ago, I think Jonas was there for that, um, that in Buddhism, which is popularly referred to as nirvana. It's a word meaning, uh, I think, extinguishing the flames of desire. It doesn't guarantee that Buddhist monks end in their experience of the unconscious, especially when we know there's plenty of them that go out there in the streets. Maybe they think it's an act of political protest and they light themselves on fire in the blaze of petrol that is your songs. And when they do it, they portray it as if it's a political gesture, a politics. It's not pretty. Um, after the traversal of the fantasy, when meaning has been deflated, there remains a kernel of jouissance fixed in repetition, compulsion, which can be isolated as one. 
And when we take the one as our point of departure, we wonder if there's a know-how, there can be a know-how obtained to reinvent the unconscious and maybe even psychoanalysis. Anyway, what was my point? Um, psychoanalysts can't do without the unconscious because it fundamentally orients them. It was why Lacan, I think, elevated the unconscious to one of four of the fundamental concepts of psychoanalysis in his well-known seminar of 1964 with the same name, the four fundamental concepts of psychoanalysis or the fundamental concepts. He isolated the unconscious as such, taking it as fundamental. And in 1976, a very important year for Lacan because it's a year where he very explicitly reassesses, resituates his prior teaching in order to highlight, uh, I mean, he does it in the most explicit manner, but in this particular moment in 1976, he returned to his 1964 seminar on the fundamentals in order to highlight again, this point about the unconscious as such. So he wrote this English preface in 1976, I think, uh, to his 1964 <laughs> seminar, this English preface. And in writing it, he demonstrated, I think, that it's not only those who we presuppose to be Malarians, followers of Jacques-Alain Malher, that we presuppose to be followers of Malher, who are intent on reading the earlier teaching of Lacan from the perspective of the later, not at all. Lacan did it himself. And it's a noticeable point. Those, look, those who read the earlier and middle, say, period of Lacan, a lot of them tend to resist the late, reading the late period. They barely touch on the stuff that's going on there. It's like they, they, they take their truth as a half saying of Lacan. And those who read the, to the end, in a more, they read in a more total way, returning again as if in a circle to the beginning. And so anyway, he opened up, I have this quote here, so I should read. He, he opened up the preface with, with the following English sentences, I quote, when the space of lapses or interpretation no longer carries any meaning, Only then is one sure that one is in the unconscious. One knows, but one has only to be aware of the fact to find oneself outside of it. I continue. There's no friendship there in that space that supports the unconscious. So I feel tempted to quote the first few lines, Simone, you probably know it. The first few lines of Derrida's, I know Daniel knows it back. The first few lines of Derrida's um, politics of friendship. Oh, my friends, there is no friend. You're each alone in your relation to the unconscious. Without any friendly or comradely support. Um, Anyway, I, I, I need to develop maybe a little bit more and ramble a little bit more before I can say something more precise uh, uh, about what, what, I, what the unconscious is politics can, can, how that phrase can orient us and especially in relation to the comrades. I don't feel like I'm ready yet. In the 19th seminar or worse, the title of the seminar or worse, Lacan isolated the concept of the one and I think it marked a decisive moment in his teaching. It also, by the way, it marks a break of sorts in the teaching of the Slovenian school. Not entirely, I know, but of sorts. So what we get is something like early middle Lacan versus the other Lacan. The one is not the same as the concept of the subject. The, the, the latter, the, uh, the, the subject is probably a concept people are much more familiar with. 
In the 24th seminar, Lacan points out that he can't even anymore use the concept of the one and subject synonymously. He, he won't even, he refuses to use the personal pronoun I, which maybe resonates for some of you as a technical concept or a function because in the Ecree, um, there's the most popular essay of, of Lacan's in the university for a particular reason probably, namely, the mirror stage is formative of the function I. It presents a subject objectified in the dialectic of identification with the other. I think that's how he puts it. A subject objectified in the dialectic of identification with the other. But when interpretation runs out of meaning, there's another knowledge possible without dialectic identification. One knows, which is a nice homophone, one knows. But there's, then you have that paradoxical part of the quotation. I'm looking at it again. One is in the unconscious, though one finds oneself outside of it. It's not exactly Althusser's definition of ideology, but it's a shocking statement. And I'm trying to present it in such a way that maybe it's less shocking and more surprising, which isn't easy because to do that, you require some ciphering, like a ciphering device of, of, of some sort, a way to cipher it. But what we find today, I think, is that there are those who do without the unconscious precisely by presupposing it. Um, they presuppose the unconscious according to its formations rather than its function as if they're witnessing the unconscious from a distance. And this distance testifies, I think, to a decoupling of our friendship with the unconscious. What Jacques-Alain Miller named the real unconscious, it's already here in Lacan. It implies that our friendship fraternities, which are made up of comrades, they offer us no ultimate support. Uh, presupposing is not the same as supposing. They're, they're two different uh, concepts with different functional outcomes. For example, the subject supposed to know, sujet supposed savoir, the subject supposed to know, is not equivalent to the one who presupposes knowledge, as in the statement, one knows. What, like, ultimately, what does one know except the other's intentions? Knowledge taken as a presupposition. That's what the one knows. And on the one, so on the one hand, the subject of the unconscious doesn't know what it already knows, which makes it an unconscious supposition of knowledge. Lacan maintained that that essentially was Freud's um, device. And that's why he didn't hesitate for a moment to call Freud an idiot, which is exactly what Lacan called Freud, an idiot. Twenty-third or twenty-fourth seminar. I don't remember where he said it. It's the knowledge that's at stake in idiotology. <laughs> which isn't for everybody, you know, it's not for me. Lacan said, I quote, Freud seems to have required that the unconscious be a knowledge involving the effect of the signifier, end quote. And it was enough at one point to make Lacan explicitly decouple from Freud. You know, he stated quite explicitly, if I remember, there's the Freudian unconscious and then there's ours. The unconscious isn't Freudian, it's Lacanian, he said. The unconscious isn't Freudian, it's Lacanian. It doesn't stop the field from being Freudian, he said something like that. Again, so on the one hand, you have the subject of the unconscious, which implies that there's an effect of the signifier. Sub the subject doesn't know what it knows, which makes um, the idiot capable of tremendous 
modesty. On the other hand, one knows what he knows. Which means one already knows in advance about the unconscious and its formations. I call that moronic. And it leads me to a point that I've made a few times, but every time I make it, I make it just a little bit differently. So let's see if I can develop it differently today. Um, uh, this idea of Slavoj, of my friend, our friend Slavoj's um, uh, statements concerning Donald Rumsfeld. Let's take it a little slower today. Um, Slavoj famously discussed Donald Rumsfeld's uh, logical justification for the American, Julius here, I'll say military exercises in Iraq. I didn't use the more common signifier of war because uh, I used the more delicate one, military exercises, uh, because the word war can be really shocking for some people in Russia today. Um, I don't think it is for you, Leah, <laughs> but for some in Russia today. Um, and, and the reason why it can be shocking, the word war as a signifier, I think it's because we are at war with the signifier. Okay, so Rumsfeld, you already know, produced something like, I don't know, let's call it an epistemological spreadsheet of sorts outlining three basic positions on knowledge. There are the known knowns, the known unknowns, and the unknown unknowns. And Slavoj, of course, realized it's not an exhaustive list. There's something missing. The fourth position. So you have known knowns, you have known unknowns, unknown knowns. Only a philosopher could have noticed that there's one missing which is the unknown knowns. It takes a philosopher to notice that. Um, so what does each concept ultimately imply? First, let's go through them slowly. First, the known knowns concern what we know that we know. We're perfectly conscious of having this knowledge. For example, I know that there's it says 24 participants in the Zoom call right now. And I know that I know it. It really doesn't require any modesty on my part to say it. It seems indistinct, in, uh, in, indisputable. I mean, it could change in a moment, but then we'll see it change and I'll know that it has changed. And so what's striking is that it's indisputable unless maybe there's a set theorist in the room and then the trouble starts. But you can't convince me for the mo in this moment right now that there are any more or less at this particular moment than 24 people in the room. That's what it's currently showing me. Okay, then there are the known unknowns, which concern our conscious limitations to knowledge, to our knowledge. And we could, we could name all kinds of philosophers, from Kant's Numenon to Wittgenstein, the last few the last part of the Tractatus or whatever. An example of the unknown or the known unknowns. I can say that there are people who might watch this video, uh, though I don't know how many will watch it. I'm aware of the limitations of my knowledge here. And I would say in some sense, this does involve some sort of epistemological modesty. So the first position is characterized by certainty. The second position is characterized by some degree of modesty of some sort. And then for Rumsfeld, finally, the final row of his spreadsheet, uh, the unknown unknowns. Put simply, it's the domain of the entirely unthinkable, beyond the limits of knowledge. There's something that we cannot even know about what we don't know. So we could say Rumsfeld lacked modesty. There was something stubborn in his commitment to the war in Iraq. And George Bush's commitment to the war in Iraq, to, oh, sorry, to the military exercises in Iraq 
Forgive me. I should have given a trigger warning. So we don't even know what we don't know about there being weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. It's a curious statement because, look, the unknown unknowns concern the void. And it's terrifying because it opens, the void opens itself up to this excess. Non-knowledge in this register, I would say, it's not exactly a negation of knowledge at all. It's an excess. It's an excess of affirmative knowledge. Which is why the statement didn't end with Rumsfeld's statement. You know, it didn't end with, we don't even know what we don't know. He continued, about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. It's, he included this affirmative certainty there where we should have encountered the void. So it comes already included in his encounter with the void as a prefabricated known known. Weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. So you have these certainties against the void of unknown unknowns. And that was Rumsfeld's stubborn conviction. And I mean it quite literally. Like what's striking here is that the signifier itself becomes a weapon of mass destruction. Like the signifier as a weapon of mass destruction, it gets deferred, pushed forward from the void, which means that it's not accepted as except as a traumatic signifier that's capable of destroying you. Had there been an effect of the signifier, a proper effect of the signifier, Rumsfeld would have produced a statement in which we would have heard an unconscious formation slip through, parapraxis, something like that. But that's not what happened in that moment when he was talking. Rumsfeld, he, he spoke very precisely without any parapraxis. In fact, it was Slavoj who had the parapraxis when describing Rumsfeld. If you go and you watch the YouTube videos of Slavoj telling the story about Rumsfeld, you'll see often, not always, but in some of the videos, he, he gets the terms mixed up and he says the known unknowns are in fact the unknown knowns and so on. He makes some slips there when he's retelling it. If Rumsfeld produced a slip, we could have found the missing fourth position in the epistemological spreadsheet, the unknown knowns. Slavoj imposed that missing place as a presupposition concerning Rumsfeld's ideological commitment. And I would even go so far as to say, it's as if he were looking in Rumsfeld's eyes and seeing his own Lacanian ideology reflected back at him. And perhaps that's what Lacanian ideology is in the end. It's interesting that when Lacan first discovered something of Lacanian ideology, I think it was in a psychotic man who used an expression of Lacan's that Lacan had used elsewhere. And he said it to Lacan when Lacan was interviewing the psychotic. The psychotic man said to Lacan, all speech is signifying. That's what the psychotic man said. And Lacan dubbed it the first Lacanian psychosis. I can tell you it would not be the last. So what's, what signaled is a decoupling of the one from the unconscious, the one from the field of the other. And it sometimes compels the one to know about the formation of the other's intentions. It's signifying articulations. And it's why our knowledge of the formations of the unconscious can operate in such a way as to stop us from being surprised. We get shocked in return. We're shocked by where the teaching of the other Lacan, the late Lacan, ultimately leads. And for Rumsfeld, there's this horror of not knowing that compelled him toward a certainty concerning the prevalence of weapons of mass destruction. He saw them everywhere, despite the fact that the evidence was missing. He was certain. 
the tacit suppositions were missing, which means that the unconscious wasn't there. Though we suppose it to be there, it wasn't. And it's why we can so easily speak about the intentions or the tone, the tone of the other without there being any clear evidence. When the signifier is foreclosed, it becomes a weapon of mass destruction. And the terrible truth is that it returns the weapon of mass destruction, those WMDs in a way, I'm speaking loosely, but in a way, aren't they now lined up on the border near Finland? Uh, maybe entering Belarus? Maybe in flybys with Taiwan, uh, toward Taiwan with China? The moment of war repeats. And despite what you might think, I would say war is a resolutely positive moment of history. It's positive, war is positive because it resists any intervention of any signifier that would negate it. Which doesn't mean that there isn't this continuous traumatic encounter with an explosive signifier because there is. So, you know, when Biden, when President Biden looked into the eyes of Vladimir Putin, President Putin, and he claimed that he saw a murderer, I would claim that the latter, Putin, was correct in stating unambiguously that the former, had, Biden, had only seen his own soul reflected back at him. I think he was right about Biden. It underlines the point. There's a movement, there's been a movement from the subject housed by the other to the one decoupled from the other and up against the world. And I think it helps us to decipher an important and surprising passage, if I could find it, from Lacan's pivotal seminar, or worse, which I'll quote now, there, there's something of the one, but there's nothing other. The one, as I have said, dialogues all alone, since it receives its own message in an inverted form. It is he who knows and not the one supposed to know. I think it reveals that for Lacan, the one is up against knowledge. Knowledge delinks from truth, the truth of the half saying, decouples from the sayings of the subject split by signifiers or whatever. And it's why I find it difficult to speak about beings in language today, because there's so many who don't maintain a subscription to the unconscious. Um, I think I have something like a subscription, sort of. I don't pay for it, I do work, like I work for, I do labor for, I don't know, publishers and, and uh, groups and stuff like that. And, and it benefits me and I enjoy it very much. And you know what they do is they send me all these psychoanalytic books and journals and, and stuff like that. I've got stacks of them now. Um, I never actually received them though, but they are sent out on a subscription delivered to my former addresses in Russia, India, Michigan, Toronto, New Brunswick, Ireland, and so on. It doesn't mean I'm without a subscription. It's just that these books and journals end up in destinations where I'm not. There's no being there. There's no being there. So I end up reading these bootlegged, <laughs> these bootlegged digital copies of printed editions from the surface of my screen. And I read the sentences as if they're typed up uh, uh, by a typewriter, although I know there's no typewriters there. There's no typewriters used at any moment in the publication process anymore. Um, the typewriter is uh, a screen memory from a digital age. And I was reading one of these digital editions recently, in a psychoanalytic journal of one sort or another, and I saw the expression un, lun, lun, conscious, one conscious, which I don't think is a better expression than the one Lacan himself used in the 24th seminar, the one blunder or one gaffe, 
which is a homophone in French. I don't know the word, it's something like un bivoups or something like that, of a French word for unconscious. Um, the unconscious as such was taken as a mistake, an accident, a blunder, whatever you like, a surprise. That's, that's the device. Uh, so, uh, I use this word device, but can we really claim that the unconscious is a device? Uh, I think that's what it was for Freud, like a typewriter. The unconscious for Freud was like a typewriter, maybe a little bit, a magical typewriter. Uh, but was it for Lacan in the end? Ultimately, I don't think the Lacanian unconscious can be taken as a device akin to a typewriter. Like what sort of magical writing pad was it for Freud? It, it kept, you know, a limitless account of all the signifying effects, forgetting nothing or something like that. My Freud is, it's a little foggy for me, but um, the typewriter accepts the the signifier and puts it into a sequence. You move the little cylinder on the typewriter from, how do you move it? You move it left to right, and then up to down, left to right, up to down in this Z-like shape. It's a Z-like shape or Z. That's the shape. Um, and it retains the totality of signifiers, retaining indefinitely these markings. It's not clear that the unconscious can ultimately accept the signifier as such. Always. Th this was maybe what Freud, and I haven't read for, uh, Derrida in a really long time, but I'm, you know, I think Derrida ultimately wrote something like this, that the, the Freud's writing pad was, was a device for thinking about the retention of the signifying effects upon memory or something like that. And I think it was why Lacan's L schema functioned a bit like a typewriter. You go from left to right, pulling the cylinder down and then up to down, left to right in this Z shape, it's the shape of the schema. Hugh's making me think of the poet, uh, is it E.E. E. Cummings? Is that it, is that his name, E.E. E. Cummings? He thought he found something like a shortcut um, he was cited by Marshall McLuhan in Marshall McLuhan's little short essay, I think in Understanding Media, it's one of these, I don't know which one it was on the typewriter. Um, but for McLuhan, Cummings was exemplary of, the, of, of a poet who made good use of the typewriter, something like that. Cummings took these short cuts moving instead of in the Z shape, he kind of moved straight down the page and so on. Um, along what Lacan called the symbolic axis. And what's really nice about Cummings poetry, I think it, McLuhan pointed this out, is that when you read it, sometimes you can kind of take a breath Like there's spaces and uh, you can stop for a moment to catch your breath. That's what the device did. It allowed you to kind of catch your breath maybe. But today we can't seem to catch our breath. We run after truth. We run and we run until we burn out. But okay, so my point, the symbolic unconscious led some political Lacanians to hold on to this dream that politics is essentially a field of constitutive lack, imminent contradiction, this sort of stuff. It's always a dialectical field. It's concerned with totality and this sort of stuff. But I believe that constitutive lack is a presupposition. And it's a presupposition that the one is represented by a signifier four or two another signifier, when in the end, the one is fundamentally without representation. And I was thinking, I hope you don't mind me rambling so much. I was thinking that like today's publishers, I know a little bit about publishing. They don't use a typewriter at all anymore. 
they don't require any typesetters really either. Um, it's less important and it's less costly than it used to be for that reason. It's just not done in that way anymore, the typesetting. Everybody today can easily publish their own book. And it's, I don't think it's much of an achievement anymore for me. I think the achievement for some would be to stop publishing books and yet not succumb to suicide in the process. You know, for some people, they'll write another book so they don't have to confront something. I don't recommend, I don't recommend it, but it, it would be an achievement. It's not easy. But maybe today's books are really just defenses against the world of the signifier. You, you won't find a signifier in any books today. You place your book on the bookshelf and it can keep the signifier from ever having to enter your world. You don't read books, it's surface. It means that the book is really just a portrait. And the bookshelf becomes reducible to or um, conflated with uh, uh, an Instagram um, feed. In the final instance, I think a book is really nothing more than a rectangular image. <laughs> you know, these, this is the way I, I find I often encounter political texts today. Slavoj cited me on this in some book a few years ago. It's in my uh, book, Jacques Lacan, American Sociology, where I point at it. Um, often the way we encounter politics today is uh, political expressions and so on, are these rectangular images circulating as quotations on social media. So where have all the typewriters gone? Again, I'm reminded of Marshall McLuhan. I wish Andrew was here, Andrew uh, McLuhan. No. Um, McLuhan said long before we started using the expression that the typewriter inaugurated uh, an echo chamber of instantaneous celebrity. His exact words, echo chamber of instantaneous celebrity. Long before we started using the phrase echo chamber. Except I think it's even worse than that. You know, McLuhan insisted that the typewriter transcribes thought but doesn't express thought. It means that the typewriter ciphers thought, which is perhaps also what Cummings was doing and, and maybe even Joyce or trying to do James Joyce, whose best friend was a typewriter. It ciphers and um, it, it even led G.K. Chesterton I don't know if I should say this. It led G.K. Chesterton to claim that typewriters allowed women to refuse being dictated to and to, how did he put it? And to become stenographers, refuse being dictated to, represented by, and to become stenographers. Um, those are Chesterton's words. It makes women into what? The function of the signifier is foreclosed. And it, I don't think it's gone unnoticed by many heterosexual men who circumambulate now around women instead of around the workplace or the filing cabinet, which was Marsha McLuhan's favorite object, um, or the church, they circumamb heterosexual men circumambulate around women. McLuhan even claimed that the typewriter, I mean, he didn't state it directly, but we know what he meant. He claimed that the typewriter was responsible for the first wave of feminism. I don't think it's a crazy claim. You know, in 1910, the United States Census reported or revealed that more than 81% of professional um, stenog stenographers, typewriters, typewriters, they were women. So gender can be taken as a signifier. Lacan said that. 
And the hipsters, of course, they tried to bring back the typewriters more than a decade ago, a uh, decade and a half ago. I even had a friend who used to carry a typewriter to the cafe. But what they showed us, I think, the hipsters with their beards and their flannel, was that they couldn't easily do it. They couldn't return to the, to the um, times of the signifier because the times have changed. Today, gender, I think it still offers some surprises, just like everything I said right now, still offers some surprises. Um, but it's clear that the signifier has become saturated in jouissance. And it's quite different from what our friends Slavoj Žižek, Alenka Suponsik, and some others have claimed. Hi, Gabriel. Um, you know what they've claimed about LGBTQ plus? You probably know it. Um, Alenka Suponsik, Slavoj Žižek claimed about LGBTQ plus. They claim that the plus in LGBTQ plus. I know there's more letters. I'm just I'm shortening it a bit. The plus. Suponsik said it stands for difference as such. Yeah. For Zizek, it's imminent antagonism. That's what he said. The plus stands for imminent antagonism. It supposes something about the human taken as a being. The plus is seen as a surplus element for them that cannot be contained within the chain of signifiers, L, G, B, T, Q signifiers. Um, it means that the plus is something like, I don't know, something like surplus you a song, or a real something like that against the signifiers LGBTQ. Maybe I'm not being as precise as I should be here. I'm not maybe giving them enough credit, but it's something like that. So what happens is for them, they say the plus keeps getting pushed forward, displacing the subject's encounter with the terrifying real or something like that. Okay, but maybe it's worse than that. I would say that gender in all of its various formations reduces the signifier to its status as you assumes. The plus is not a real, which resists signification absolutely or whatever, surplus you assumes, whatever, imminent antagonism, difference as such. It's not, that's not what it is. I disagree, not at all. It's not some surplus element that's been cut by some symbolic device. It's the opposite. Each letter that we add to the series, LGBTQ, stands already for difference as such, already. That's already inscribed in culture. Each stands for an affirmative jouissance, L, G, B, these are affirmative you songs, one all alone, each is a one all alone, in a series that repeats. And the series, these ones, are resistant to the effects of the signifier. It means that the plus should be taken precisely as the signifier itself. The plus is the signifier that would finally put an end to the series. It's an encounter that keeps getting repeated, delayed, postponed with the signifier because it's foreclosed. Uh, but you know, the letter always arrives at its destination since it returns, they don't know what to do with it. So, because they don't wanna to go to the end, you keep pushing it. So I'm outlining a fundamental difference. The plus is the endless deferral of the signifier that would put an end to the repetition, that would bar and negate the affirmative jouissance that's at stake in the repetition of the series. It means that the plus isn't a plus at all. It's a faux plus, <laughs> a faux pas, a placeholder for the ineffective Nom de pair, demonstrating precisely that it's weakened. It's, it's, the plus is a negation that can't be accepted by the series. You keep going, affirming more and more of the jouissance of the ones all alone. 
Me too. Me too. Me too. And then you can keep going um, because you never, you never have to interrupt the cylinder on your typewriter because it can keep writing and writing as if by magic. Um, and it's this point about affirmative jouissance that I, I want to try. I'm not sold on it. I want to try to develop maybe a bit more next week and maybe in a more focused and shorter lecture. Hopefully I can discover something in what I've said uh, and try and clean up this mess. Um, I need some clarity. For now, I think what I want to do is try and bring it to something of a close. Um, and then maybe place everybody into mini cartels where you'll elect a plus one and have a short discussion on whatever you like. I'll join the cart one of the cartels too. Uh, but before, I, st I still wanna say a couple more things real quick. Uh, the parletre, parler être, the parletre, speaking being, unlike the subject of the signifying effect, the parletre speaks with its jouissance, which makes it different from the human being. We see this affirmative jouissance clearly, I think, today in this shift that's occurred. As you know, I've re repeated it before, please forgive me. Um, the shift that occurred somewhere since the days of queer theory, which I'm not lamenting, where you doubt it, there was a doubting at stake in when you face the, the restroom. What is it called again, Mark, the loo? When you face the, the loo. The... Well, in Liverpool, we call it the bog. But, uh, you know, we, bog. We, uh, the bog, but what's right. it called? Yep. The, you know, the loo is generally the sort of, uh, you know, uh, British, polite, uh, nonsensical signifier. We go, go, go in the loo. It's all, it's, uh, you, need, again, you need to go in the loo. You know, <laughs> sort okay. of well, you, face, you face the door. And when you're facing the door, you say, am I really this? gender that the Lou says I am, the restroom door, the bathroom door, whatever, um, to the latest era where there's maybe perhaps more certainty regarding one's gender. And so you walk right in to the door without any doubts. Um, but you wonder about the other's intentions when you're in there. And don't think about my intentions when I'm saying this, by the way. I consider myself a fierce supporter uh, of those movements, a friend of them. But I think the contemporary political situation demands another analysis. And I think, well, since nobody's doing it, I'm trying to. I don't think I'm very good at it. Probably many of you could do it better than I can, but I'm trying, which means um, I'm alone in my cause. Uh, and I think these coordinates, whatever there have been and what I've said, um, uh, hopefully they can offer some clarity next week um, when I can finally talk about this expression, the unconscious is politics, which was a statement that Lacan made, of course, I'll repeat it in full. I dare not say that politics is the unconscious, but that the unconscious is politics. I dare not say that the unconscious, that, the, that politics is the unconscious, but that the unconscious is politics, a statement from Lacan that's very enigmatic. It's a, a movement from the unconscious structured like a language toward the unconscious is politics. A movement from the unconscious coupled with the symbolic unconscious, it's the symbolic unconscious, toward the real unconscious. The unconscious is politics means that we now witness our unconscious out there in the field of politics from which we are segregated. And it was why Lacan insisted when he made the statement that the unconscious is politics, that some prefer to be rejected from capitalism without offering themselves up to being admitted into the benefits of capitalism. That's how he put it, that's what he said. And maybe it seems as though Lacan is a, a neoliberal or something here, and like he's supporting capitalism. It's not clear to me that he was, 
But when he made this statement, he said the other has become maternal. And to reject the other, in this case, capitalism, is to, quote, save oneself from being engulfed by the maternal, end quote. And it was why he said that it's necessary, as in the case of the neurotic, to first offer oneself up before um, one becomes rejected. You need to first offer yourself up. And it's why I need to sort this logic out because I'm not convinced that Lacan was a capitalist or a liberal or even a neoliberal. But capitalism today is this paradoxical other from which we have become uncoupled. So it's the basis for this logic of segregation. You witness the unconscious as the political in that shocking place where the other appears for you. The unconscious is politics, means that we can see the unconscious out there in the target of our politics, in the place from which we ourselves have become decoupled without offering ourselves up as political subjects. And when you do this, the surprise for me is that you're not at all taking a political position. You're just witnessing your politics from a safe distance. There's no subject of politics there, no being there. So we can't say anything about this device that we call the unconscious. There can be no politics of the unconscious. I think, uh, let's stop there and, and we'll go to uh, cartels if Daniel can set them up. Okay, I'm gonna stop the YouTube live stream so we have a little more privacy. So peace out everybody on YouTube.